It's October 22nd, 2020. This is Rook. If you want to be proud of humans of Iranian descent around the world, get ready to discover two millennials currently in Europe who are very different from each other, but unified in impressiveness. First to France, where Zartosht Bakhtiari has become the first mayor of Iranian descent in a city in that country, and one of the youngest ever at age 30. He joins me, and then to Denmark, where the well-known Iranian teacher, model, and biker Shima Mehri has become the first woman in the world to be head road captain for Harley Davidson. There's no containing Shima. This is conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there. Welcome to episode number 55 of Rook. Hope you are all doing well out there. Surviving. We are coming to you on SoundCloud, on YouTube, on Spotify, on Instagram, iTunes, and Telegram. And by the way, our Telegram channel is completely bilingual in Persian and English. So if you prefer to consume your messages and posts in Farsi, the Persian and English are happening on our Telegram channel, which is at Rook Media. We are on our ongoing mission to build a a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. And, you know, those of us in North America sometimes tend to reflexively think of the Persian diaspora as only being people of Iranian descent, you know, in North America, like a, a typically myopic way of thinking. But it goes along the lines of, oh, yeah, the Iranians outside of Iran are in uh, Los Angeles, uh, Tehran, Jadis, you know, or uh, Toronto, Toronto, or Washington, Washington, etc. Of course, that is not true. And in fact, as I've mentioned on this program a few times, as uh, we grow this show, we are growing large audiences for this program in places like Germany uh, and Australia and the UK and Sweden. So today, uh, it's an all European edition of Rook. Uh, looking really looking forward to these two guests. First, Zartosht Bakhtiari. He is the the thirty year old mayor of a French city not far from Paris. He's one of the youngest mayors in the history of France, and he is an Iranian-French kid who's, uh, you know, he's doing impressive things. He joins me from Nuit-sur-Marne in just a few minutes. We'll go to Zartorscht. And then, in about an hour from now, Shima Mehri in Denmark, an Iranian biker. And in 2016, she became the first woman in the world to be a head road captain for Harley-Davidson. Uh, Shima's got a great story. We will go to her uh, so that's all coming up. Hello, Groovy Shia. Hi, Jian Jun. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hi, Jian Jun. Hello. John or Jun? I don't know which one to go with sometimes. Depends on how you're feeling yeah. about me, I suppose. I, I'm feeling the June, oh, June today. Jian thank Jun. you, Keon Jun. <laughs> uh, and hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, Sam. Uh, Captain Reza, uh, how, are, how have you been? I'm pretty great, in fact. Oh. Wow, okay. Yeah. Well, why are you so great? <laughs> I went to uh, the exhibition yesterday. You Van did? You, ex- I took you, your advice. You, oh, you went, went to the Van Gogh Immersive. That's correct. And you also took my advice that uh, <laughs> should you go to this spectacular uh, uh, this spectacular immersive right. display of interactive yeah. art and social distancing at yeah. the same time that it may be enhanced yes. if yes yeah. if if uh, a very legal spleef <laughs> has been is consumed You're using the french the That's spleef, right. spleef. Yeah, spleef. Yeah. i was going to yeah. ask that did you consume well any? i can't confirm or deny because i've signed that <laughs> nda i was with a very uh, special person uh. so, so you see smoke some weed yes that's, that's right. it 
smoke the year. I smoke and them. you've been uh, you've been a little concerned lately about um, uh, like I don't I, huh. you know you're a very handsome man. <laughs> we call you Captain Reza Khoshtip, you know, off the air. But uh, but you've been concerned about some weight gain. Yeah, I yeah. have a little bit. I yeah. got some comments from uh, some of our coworkers <laughs> who have said. Uh, you must have gained a little bit of weight. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy during the quarantine period. No. You know, we're all. So my question to you is what ran through uh-huh. my head is, uh-huh. see, I think that the problem with the weed, yeah. if there's a problem with it, it's that uh, certainly in my, you know, if I've ever, I, I would, I get the munch. I got to eat. I got to eat more and more and more. So did you not? So, so I'm guessing mm-hmm. that it the the having the spectacular enhanced experience of the Van Gogh yeah. was worth it to you, yeah. even if it meant yeah. eating the extra bag of chips you ate when you got home because I, I you ate, were stoned. I ate like a horse yesterday, yeah, yeah. but it was worth it. It was worth every okay. second. All right, and yeah, that's that's yeah. fine. No, it is. It yeah, is. I must have gained. You're probably huge. Temp- <laughs> you're, you're you're barely. <laughs> No. Oh, yeah. I think you look just great. Aww, Don't listen to the haters. Thank you. Uh, there's you no saying? hates. There's no hate. I, in fact, it's it's all in Reza's mind. He does look great, but he's been. I know he's because he's been concerned about that. He keeps bringing it up and Aww. saying, about it. "Do I look fat in this? Is that what he's doing?" <laughs> he's kind of doing that. Uh, the fabulous Keon. I know we got a lot of. Um, Nice response to the Reza Rohani episode, we did, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so Reza Rohani, the uh, performer, the pianist, the the musician who dabbles in both jazz mm-hmm. and classical, uh, we had him on our last episode. I want to tell you about a new posting that we have in our Rook Reads section of our website. So, so we've started this. Uh, it's basically a blog mm-hmm. we call Rook Reads, and so you go to our website and you hit the reads. Negin Dusti à la vie has written a new piece for us called uh, Reza Rohani and the Flight of Talent. And uh, it's now posted at, at rookmedia.com at our Rook Reads section. And I thought this was really interesting. I want you to check it out because, um, um, you know, my takeaway from that interview, as I said after the interview, was that, uh, I, I mean, they, I, I loved it. I really enjoyed speaking to Reza. But the most interesting part for me was the dynamic with his father. Mm. Of course, he is the son of a very, very famous, you might even say legendary uh, composer and piano player and musician, Anushirabon Rohani, uh, who's still in Iran. And the f- we discussed the fact that Reza um, not only doesn't seem to mind being in the shadow of his very famous father, but he celebrates it and loves his dad and half of his Instagram is pictures of his, his dad and et cetera. That was my big takeaway from that interview. Negin's takeaway, as she explains in this piece, uh, was very interesting for her the most salient point was sadness. Really? Yes, that this guy, I mean, certainly not emanating from Reza. As you remember, Reza Rohani was very positive Mm -hmm. and had a great sort of uh, positive disposition. But but in this piece, Nagin argues that she finds it sad that this guy ultimately had to leave Iran twice the first time he leaves to go do school for in germany but the second time he leaves uh and now he's been in the u.s for 20 years was because the kind of music that is his passion which is jazz and you know alternative jazz or different Mm -hmm. kinds of jazz uh is just not something he could really pursue in Iran. His music was getting banned. There really isn't much of an industry there and all that. And so her takeaway is, and I think the question she poses in this piece is, uh, is this always the way it has to be? You know, that, that... what is the price to be paid of being an interesting uh, creative person? Is it always exodus? Do you always have to leave the homeland? Of course, she's writing this as somebody who as well is in the diaspora. But I thought that that was interesting that that was her, her takeaway. I didn't think of it that way, but I see what she means now because there's only so much you can grow as an artist in Iran, sadly. Uh, it, depending on the kind of music you're playing, I guess, but certainly if you're playing jazz. Would that make sense to you, Shaya? Uh, yes, actually, uh, that, that's a very good point. If you play jazz, you actually you have kind of no future in Iran. It's like you have a traditional Persian music band in, for example, 
um, f- Austin. You know, mm. there's no fee. You yeah, know. yeah. But I, I, I think maybe the reason it didn't occur to us p- potentially is because <laughs> you could almost make that argument. You write this piece every week and sort of go, "It's sad that these people had to leave. It's sad that the person had to leave." Yeah. But um, but I thought it was interesting that she. She she took away from, because on the face of it, this interview is a about a guy who's very you know happy with his life mm-hmm. and uh, uh, he certainly got a very um, I liked that he owned his own privilege. He knows he's a lucky yeah. guy. He knows that he comes from a famous dad. He knows that he's had some good breaks. He's also super talented. Has worked hard. I don't want to take anything away from that. And obviously has a huge fan base. We heard from them. We've been getting yeah. lovely letters letters about him. And everything, but uh, but that she listening to Reza Rohani felt the sadness that this guy. You know, he couldn't do this on your own. Even when your dad is the famous the guy, and 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 you know, you, you want to play your music. It's it, you're going to have to do that. Behind the scenes, you're going to be banned. You're not really going to have a career. You know, I mean, uh, and so anyway, that's at rookmedia.com. Go to our Rook Reads, and we've got a comment section there. So if you want to respond, she uh, ends her piece saying, uh, do you agree with me? What do you think? Uh, mm. You can you can go there and and, uh, and respond to this or give your thoughts. Yes, Shai? I remember I bought Reza Rohani's tickets in Tehran to go to his show and one day before his show his concert got cancelled and mm. you know because Ershad because yeah sometimes they just cancel s- concerts yes yes yeah. because because, because, because yeah you're the, probably you're the son of Anush Ravon Rohani I don't know why but you know uh. it's it's yeah if you go to our website rookmedia.com you'll also see our patrons page a way to support Rook uh, head over to where it says support Rook and you'll see links to, uh, we'd love you to support us, by the way, if you want in any amount possible. And if and you will also see links to our different social media platforms there, including our Instagram. Uh, and if you don't already follow us on Instagram and you want to, it's at Rook Media, where you can find our Rook Minutes produced by Savvy Roham or uh, sometimes also known as Savvy Sibyl Rohan. <laughs> half man, half, half mustache, Sibyl. half Sibyl. <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> so we've got uh, a bunch of letters to get to. Yes, Kian? Yes. Uh, we'll get to those in just a little while. And we've got Shima Mehri in Denmark in about, I don't know, 45 minutes from now. But first... There are myriad interesting stories when it comes to different folks and their journeys across the globe in the Iranian diaspora. And often when we are talking about young guests of Iranian descent, it has been because they're actors or musicians or sports stars. Today, now, a guy who is the first Iranian-French mayor of a city in France. He was elected just a few months ago, and he's 30 years old, making him one of the youngest mayors in France in general ever. Zartusht Bakhtiari was born in France to Iranian parents from Gilan who had immigrated during the Islamic Revolution of 1979. He grew up in Nuit-sur-Marne, a town in the vicinity of Paris with a population of 40,000. When he was in high school during the presidential campaign period of Nicolas Sarkozy, Zartosh decided to become a lawyer and study political science. He holds a master's degree now in labor law from the University of Paris, too, and entered the field of urban activities in 2010 in the city of neville sur marne Forming a citizens association, Zartosh's efforts became a major contributor to the lives and the people of that city since 2010. And in the past six years, he's not stopped being active. In fact, Zartosh became the head of the first opposition group within the city council. In 2019, five years after the election of the city's former mayor, Zartosh started his campaign for the mayor. The first round of elections were held just before the COVID-19 confinement on the 15th of March of this year. And finally, on on the 28th of June, at the age of 30, Zatosht won the election in a landslide, defeating the mayor by winning the maximum number of votes. And right now, the mayor of Nuit-sur-Marne, Zatosht Bakhtiari, joins me from his town in France today. Hello, sir. Bonjour. Hello. Bonjour. Thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, what a pleasure it is to talk to you. Congratulations on your victory. It's, it's been three or four months. What's it like being the mayor of your French town? Actually, it's uh, very, it's a very, very important uh, function in, in France. Uh, as a mayor, I have a lot of responsibility, and and now, uh, spe- specifically now, uh, because of the COVID, 
and uh, uh, I, I spent uh, uh, 15 or 16 hours per day here in, in my city hall, uh, <laughs> uh, doing all the best I can do, uh, managing the people of my team. And uh, actually, it's a, it's a very beautiful function because you are very uh, close to people and you, you, you feel their, uh, their, their needs, their uh, ambition, their dreams. And I think that it's a very, uh, uh, very uh, beautiful gift uh, that uh, the people <laughs> gave me uh, with, with, uh, with this election. You know, Zatars, it's interesting because during this COVID period, I think we've really seen a, an ascendance, at least in the profile, if not the responsibilities of mayors all around the world. Because COVID can be so important in a local, localized way in terms of how you're going to deal with it. We know the names of the mayor of New York City or the mayor of London or the mayor of Toronto, um, if we didn't know them before, because they're so integral to, to dealing with this crisis. I want to get to that with you. But first, set, set the scene for us. I mean, we know what, where and what Paris is. How would you describe nuit sur mer Actually, nuit sur mer uh, is a town of uh, 40,000 uh, people located very close to Paris, and we have a, a, a very good location because uh, we are uh, very close to Paris, but we have a certain distance, and uh, we have uh, very uh, important parks, and and we have the uh, the the Marne River in in the city. So uh, actually, we are uh, very close to Paris, but we have a certain distance, uh, which gives us uh, a certain liberty uh, on the organization of uh, what we want to do. Uh, for example, we we can we can organize different uh, events for people, and we have more uh, green spaces. Um, people. Um, uh, feel better here more than in certain uh, uh, areas of Paris. So you have autonomy. You're not just yeah. a suburb. Exactly. Exactly. What was the first thing you did when you took office in June or July? <laughs> Actually, I have uh, spent a lot of time um, in discussion with with the people who work here uh, because we have uh, more uh, near uh, one thousand people who work for the for the city. So uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, by, by their side, and uh, we had to uh, set a lot of meetings uh, in order to uh, to handle this uh, this COVID uh, period. And it was a, a bit hard because uh, during the uh, the, the last uh, months, uh, people were uh, in their house uh, and we had to uh, organize different events for people yes. uh, during the summer. But we had to uh, guarantee their, their secu security too. So it was a very strange period, but uh, very exciting for me because I'm uh, a, a young man with a lot of energy. So uh, it was very, very good for me. Uh, and it wasn't very stressful for me. But um, it, it was a very strange period. Well, it's a bit of a roller coaster. It's some, somewhat tumultuous, but I, I, I'm glad that you have so much energy. It's energizing talking to you. I have to say, <laughs> you're the you. mayor of a French town. You've got a charming French accent, but I have to keep reminding myself, you're a Persian <laughs> kid, like me too. You're a Persian kid. <laughs> so it cannot have escaped the eyes and ears of those in Iran that a young Iranian guy has become a mayor in France. What reaction did you get from Iran? A lot of very positive messages, and and uh, you know, I have a, a a part of my family who live who still uh, lives in in Iran, in the north of Iran, uh, and in Tehran. They, they g gave me a lot of uh, very good vibes and and very good uh, uh, energy by uh, by Instagram, by Facebook, by uh, by mail, and different messages that I've received. Uh, people say me that they they are uh, they are interrogating themselves and, and they say uh, what if in Iran uh, we, we, we made something like that it, w was it possible uh, in Iran uh, to elect a, a young guy uh, who has only 30 years old and and who has a, a foreign background and it was it was a bit disturbing but but I think that they they, they hope uh, a lot of things. And, and uh, I think that it was a very good message. But even in France, actually, uh, I think that I'm, I, I can say that I'm very proud of this French uh, people uh, who, who, who gave me my, my chance uh, with a very uh, strange name <laughs> for French people. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's a, a, very, a, a very good message that they uh, uh, send to the, to, 
the friends yes, uh, to yes. friends and to people. Yeah, I think it was well, very good. Was there any reaction from the government in Iran or the regime or or the Islamic Republic no, me- no, no. media? No, no, not at all. Ah, interesting. So, okay, let me. I, I want to come back to your identity and who you are and how and how you got elected. But, but we started talking about COVID. I mean, France has been hit hard by the second wave of COVID nineteen, Zatosh. And the start of your career as mayor coincided with this crisis. Uh, how has that complicated your job? And I can only imagine this is not the situation you had in mind when you dreamt, dreamt of being mayor for the last few years. So, as a decision maker, what have been the challenges and concerns that you've had? to overcome, to implement ideas and, and deal with the spread of COVID-19 in nuit man Actually, uh, being able to, to manage this, this crisis uh, at uh, the local level and, and, and be uh, very uh, um, in a position of uh, proximity with, with people and, and uh, be able to, to gather people and, and make different things in order to save other people who have uh, nobody to help them uh, it, it, it's a very, um, a very interesting uh, thing to do. Uh, it's very hard because we cannot do everything we 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 sh- we want to do. Uh, for example, we we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, actions um, in distinction of 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 uh, senior people uh, who cannot, uh, uh, for example, uh, buy uh, different things, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, f- some food, for example, in, in different stores. Uh, there, we have a lot of people who cannot uh, afford uh, different things because they have uh, uh, no job or they cannot uh, uh, go to Paris because of uh, uh, you know different limitations. Uh, so uh, actually, we we have to uh, we have to to be very involved and 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 uh, uh, you know the, the plans that you can have today may change totally uh, tomorrow. Yes. So we have to 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 have a a very um, uh, important focus on, on flexibility and and be very uh, responsive to different demands, and that makes the job very interesting. Uh, you're right. It is absolutely not what I had in mind uh, when, even when I uh, when I've been elected uh, three months and a half uh, uh, ago. But uh, I think that. Uh, this uh, makes the job very interesting because it changes every day. Well, I dare say, it, it, your um, perhaps your modest to say interesting. It uh, maybe another word would be daunting or scary. This is <laughs> this is life and death stuff, and you are now on the front lines of this. People's lives are at stake, um, which is you know again pr- probably more than anybody would bargain for in terms of being a mayor of forty thousand people. You wouldn't think that you're going to be thrust into this moment that um yeah. where people are you know literally dying do, do you ever um ha- has there been a moment in in recent weeks or months that uh where you felt overwhelmed by this where you feel like this is really scary stuff no actually i i remember that uh the, uh, it was i think the second or the third uh, day of my of my mandate i i i just during one moment i i asked myself what should I do? I don't know. I'm a bit lost. But uh, a few seconds later, I told to myself, I cannot uh, ask this kind of question. I'm here. I have to do the, the, the job. And there is no question to have. So no uh, interrogation to, to have in, in mind. We have to we have to go forward and we have to uh, we have to do the job. So uh, I'm not authorizing myself to be scared of something. That's my my philosophy of how to how to do this job. I mean, you also you grew up in this town. Like you, you. I'm imagining you know people. You probably know people personally who are sick right now. They're pro- probably people you've known for years. Yes, and that yes. must be quite emotional too. Yes, but but we have to, you know, to to be very human. So we have uh, human feelings, but we have to um, to do uh, the things that we have to do. So. Uh, and and we have different uh, limitations too because of the budget because of different financial things so it's uh, it's it, it can be a very difficult job to do uh, but we have to uh, we have to put aside uh, the different uh, uh, you know different feelings which may uh, 
make the things more complicated sure, uh, sure. to to to, yeah. to go on. So it confuse so, things. Yeah. Um, Zatosh, t- t- tell, let's. Uh, I'll come back to you being mayor and some of the challenges. But t- tell us a bit about your childhood in France. I mean, the story goes. This is going to be the famous story now. But that that you, <laughs> from what I understand, you always wanted to get into politics. Even as a kid, you said you wanted to be Jacques Chirac, who was the, yes, exactly. of course, the former president of France. He was prime minister and president of France. What? Why did you have that political ambition in you as a kid? I don't really know. Uh, because when you are four or five years old, uh, you know, you have some things on you uh, and uh, you, you, you cannot explain that. So I've always been uh, interested in, in politics. And uh, as you said, as a uh, toddler in, in kindergarten, I used to say uh, the job I wanted to uh, to later have was uh, being uh, Jacques Chirac, the former French president. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I was only four years old and I, I cannot explain that. But later, uh, actually in, in high school, I, I was, uh, uh, I had changed my, my plans because I, I, I planned to, to study uh, medicine. Uh, but uh, it was the period of the of the campaign of the president Sarkozy. Yes. And uh, his campaign inspired me uh, to completely... Uh, change my career plans and, and, and to study politics and law uh, instead of, uh, of medicine. And I, at that moment, I really uh, started to, to became, became a, a politically active and be involved in politics. So uh, actually, I had this in, in, in me uh, from ever. <laughs> are, 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 your, are your parents political? You know, a lot, of, a lot of Iranian parents in the diaspora, especially as immigrants, shy away, want their kids to shy away from... You know, like, a, <laughs> stay away from that kind of thing. Uh, what, 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 did they encourage you or were they concerned about your interests in politics? Actually, they they, they were uh, they, they, they were very in, in, interested in politics too, and I think that uh, you know I had a lot of politics debates in in, uh, in the living room and, and 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 everywhere. So it was very interesting to have this uh, this uh, connection to politics with with my parents because, but for example, my sister uh, doesn't like the politics and she's not very interested in politics. So I, I cannot say that. Uh, this explains everything you know i think that when you when you come uh, in this uh, in this uh, world uh, you have some things on you and 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 this was something that uh, i had uh, on me and i think that uh, i worked on it and and maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, for example it, it may change uh, later because we have a lot of plans, but I, I, I think that my interest in politics will never change i think is that your sister will, is your sister older or younger than you She's uh, younger than me. And is she in is she in uh, Nuit sur Marne? No, actually, she lives uh, abroad, and and she is in uh, in fashion uh, in the fashion industry. Okay. Industry. She, she, uh, Did yeah. that coincide with you becoming mayor? She was like, "I'm out of here. Then I'm leaving. If this guy's going to be mayor." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I'm sure she. Do, 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 how does she feel about her brother being mayor? Her she, older she, brother. She is very very proud, and she she has very good feelings uh, about that channel. How did you, Zatosh? How did you identify as a kid? I mean, obviously, you were born in France, and so you're. A French citizen, but I know you used to visit Iran, uh, Shumal, quite regularly. How, how did you culturally see yourself growing up? Actually, um, I cannot uh, say exactly uh, because I, I, I think that uh, uh, everyone is, is a bit different. And uh, the Iranian and Persian culture, uh, heritage and language uh, are very uh, close to my heart and and. and uh, a, a true part and they are a true part of my of my identity so uh, i think that i'm totally french but i think that i have a total uh, uh, link with the with the persian culture and and the persian uh, uh, civilization so uh, i i cannot uh, give to myself a, a very uh, a short definition um, i don't know uh, I, i'm not lost at all because i i find a lot of beautiful things in the different cultures and i think that it's uh, it's not very difficult to be um, iranian french and and uh, and a lot of uh, other things when um, you were a kid or when you were in school or even high school were uh, were the other kids aware that your background is iranian 
Yes, because actually the, 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 my, my first name and last name are very, very specific. <laughs> They're not traditional <laughs> French names. <Yeah. laughs> and for, for Iranian people, they actually, when they say my name, they, they know that I'm, I'm Persian. But yes. um, for, for, for French people, it's a bit more difficult, even if the, there is a, 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 very, uh, a very famous uh, uh, German philosopher who writes about Zarathustra. Uh, so uh, actually, the different uh, uh, teachers ask me uh, where, w- w- what are my backgrounds, and 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 so I I, I give them the the different explanations, and and it was very very simple for me to to explain that. So tell me about this political career. That's the story is you started your political career by creating a citizens association. Uh, tell tell us briefly about that. What was that? Yes, actually, uh, when I was a, a law student, um, I, I told to myself that it was very important to interest uh, young people to, to politics, and uh, I, I've created, I've created with the different uh, uh, students and, and friends uh, a, a first association, and, and the, the, the goal was to interest uh, different uh, young people to politics. And uh, I've um, worked a lot uh, in my in my city too, uh, in order to to make different uh, things, in order to to make politic uh, uh, to make real uh, different politic things uh, that we we can uh, uh, say. And and uh, you know, politic concepts uh, of uh, equ- uh, equality or uh, solidarity and and different things uh, that you, you you can make them uh, real and, and not just words. Yes. And uh, Actually, we have, uh, and then I, I uh, run uh, for mayor uh, within my city of Nesoman in 2014, so at age of uh, uh, 23. But at that moment, it was absolutely impossible to uh, to to beat the well-established uh, mayor uh, who who had been uh, uh, continually uh, elected by the people since uh, 1977. Uh, but well, t- tell me, tell me something. Why, for, I'm always curious when people are are so avid about running for office. If if I can ask you, I mean, philosophically, if not ideologically, why why did you believe, even at the age of 23, when you first ran in 2014? that you could be more effective in municipal office, in other words, running to become mayor and becoming a mayor, rather than, say, trying to create change as an activist or lobbyist or someone who's involved outside of political institutions? Because I think that in France, um, the role of, of politics is very important. That, uh, and I know and I hear everywhere uh, people say uh, politics have no power and and the lobbyists or different uh, you know in france uh lobbyists are 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 not uh, as present as as in in your countries in uh-huh. canada or in, in the united states in france uh politics are, are more uh involved than lobbyists are, are, are not very you know they have not a very good image uh, for uh, for the for the people but I, I think that we can do a lot of things uh, in politics and it won't be true to say politics have no power uh, politics cannot do anything they cannot change things i think that and i see when i am here uh, from uh, 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 since uh, since uh, june uh, 2020 uh, actually when you are uh, here uh, sitting in this chair and, and uh, uh, leading this this city you can do uh, a lot of things uh, you can decide because uh, you know every every day i i make uh, more than 100 of decisions here uh, for for the city right uh, you know it can be for the uh, for, for for different events but it can be uh, security matters it can be uh, for uh, you know for for feeding people etc etc so uh, say that saying that uh, it, it, you cannot do anything won't be true and in in 2014 actually i think that uh, i was not uh, totally uh, mature for for this function and i'm very happy to have been elected now and, and yeah. not in 2000 now that you're so old yeah yeah, and, and you know, it, <laughs> it, 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 you know, I have six more years and six more years sure, of maturity, sure, sure. and I have been, uh, you know, I, I'm lawyer uh, from 2000 uh, uh, since uh, 2014. So I think that I've learned a lot of things. I have, you know, every people have a lot of things to learn uh, during all the life. But 
uh, all life long. But I, I think that now it was a good moment. Maybe in six years it would be uh, better, <laughs> even better. But uh, but that, Zatosh, that's Zatosh, the, the story, yeah, the story think, of yeah. your recent election victory is all the more remarkable, is all the more impressive when we find out. See, I had heard about you becoming the mayor. I didn't know that you unseated a mayor who was there for, for 43 years. Um, this is, I mean, because we know at a municipal level, I'm sure even in France, uh, all over the world, it, it, the, 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 the politics benefit the incumbent, right? Because yes. they, they run the bureaucracy, everybody knows them. It's very hard to unseat a mayor at the best of times, let alone a guy who's been there for four decades. Um, let me take this one step at a time. Did you encounter resistance because of your youth, first of all? I I mean, I'm sure somebody yes. would make the argument, uh, okay, that's very nice, maybe even patronizingly, like nice, nice boy, but you know, how, how do you expect that you're going to come in and become mayor and unseat this guy? Yeah, absolutely. A, lo a lot of people uh, say that to me, uh, you know, you are too young and you, uh, but, but, but uh, I think that people wanted uh, uh, change and uh, people actually, uh, a lot of them uh, knew me because um uh, during the six uh, past years, I have been uh, very active, and I was, uh, you know, uh, elected uh, within the, the city council, the, um, and uh, and I I, I was uh, physically present on on different events, and I think that I've uh, created a, a, a certain uh, link, and and you know, we we have uh, um, made a lot of things too uh, for for people, so. They knew me, but even if they so 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 the former mayor was well known by by people, but people wanted change, and 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 that's why they elected me as as mayor. I think that they it was a very uh, good thing, and I think that I'm really really proud not of me, but proud of these people yes. uh, who who uh, uh, were able to trust me and to to trust this uh, the reality of the change. Uh, uh, well, well you, you you weren't just young, or you aren't just young. You're also um, a second generation immigrant. You're Iranian, yes. and and I, I want to be. I want you to be rook about this. You know, to be honest about this, because we we recently had. Um, uh, Iranian French tennis star Aravana Rezaei on the program. I don't know if you know her. She's in Saint Etienne, but she, but but you know, she she's one of the best tennis players in the world. Even though she was yes. born in France and grew yeah. up in France and is a French national, she said that she's had to deal with some racism for being Iranian and brown, as she called it, when she was a teenage tennis player competing in France. Of course, when she became successful, they liked her more. But did you ever experience any kinds of questions about your background and were your Iranian roots at all an issue when you were running for mayor actually the iranian roots uh, are not very <laughs> bad and and, and uh, i had uh, i never had any any difficulty with with my 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 backgrounds uh, I, I imagine and i know that for different backgrounds uh, uh, it's not the same for example for for people of the uh, north of africa in france i i know that there is a lot yes. of them. But no, I, I never had any any uh, th this kind of message. I, I know that some people say something because uh, some people of my team uh, told me that uh, different different people say uh, racist uh, had uh, racist uh, uh, comments and, uh, yeah, yeah and different things about about me. But uh, no, uh, n nobody said me uh, for example that my backgrounds were were. Was a was a real problem for me. No. Is there much of a Persian community in in Nui Sirman? Is there a, no, a, a local local kebab? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that uh, we we should be uh, less than ten. <laughs> <laughs> so there's right, right, right. So it, uh, th this is very curious to me that, <laughs> I, as you say yourself, it's quite inspiring about what it says about this relatively small city. You know, we would expect to see an immigrant mayor in a place like Paris or a cosmopolitan place. You know. Sadiq Khan yes. in London. But, you know, we tend to believe, and I'm sure it's a stereotype in many, many cases, but we are tend to believe, we tend to believe that smaller centers or smaller cities are less tolerant. Um, can, can you reflect on that and what you've seen in this uh, small city of yours in France? 
Actually, uh, my city is very close to Paris, so I think that it's a bit different. I, I think that if you are in in the you know very very far from a, a big city, it may be different. Uh, if people uh, don't know you and and you you know the the name and the the color of the skin may, may be a, a bit uh, difficult for you to be elected, but. Uh, near to Paris and close to Paris, I think the things is, are, are a bit different because we have uh, a lot of people uh, uh, here, uh, even with the, uh, foreign backgrounds. Uh, and and I, I don't, I don't think that it's it's really it's a very uh, important problem here in 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 the suburb of of Paris. You know, I was going to ask you if being of Persian background, you think it's possible for you to reach higher levels of political office in France. But I, I'm guessing... I hope so. I I, hope I'm guessing so. you think it, it, it is possible. You don't think that would be an issue for you, a yeah. barrier for you? No, I, I don't think so, because uh, uh, I, I don't think it would be a problem, because I have uh, very, you know, um, I, I'm involved in politics uh, since 2010, and uh, I have met a lot of uh uh, very uh, well-known politicians here and I have very good connections with them and uh, you know here we have uh, a region uh, which is led by by uh, a woman uh, who is uh, very uh, very involved and, and that I, I know her very well and uh, the economy minister of France uh, I, I know him too because I've made a lot of uh, things with with him uh, and I think that uh, they never considered me as a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a foreigner or kid of fo fo right. foreigner, and right. you know, I, I have very good uh, uh, links and, and very. Uh, I made that I did the job, and I think that uh, uh, French people can can trust people if you you make the job, and that's all. Uh, that's the only thing uh, which matters. I think. I hope. Will your will your office now, the, the fact that you're the mayor of a town, I mean, besides your busy schedule, will this at all um, hamper your ability to tra travel back and forth to Iran now? Oh, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think so because actually I'm involved in, in France and I'm not in the Iranian uh, politics and I think that uh, uh, <laughs> people can can uh, can uh, make the difference between the different functions. So I, I don't think so. I don't think it would If the Iranian play. community in France is anything like the Iranian community in Canada or the U.S., or <laughs> there, there's probably people sometimes getting in touch with you, encouraging you to take political positions on what's happening back in Iran. And I'm guessing you, yeah. you try to avoid getting involved in that? Yes, because for, for, for the moment, you know, I, I'm the mayor of a city and I have to do my job here and, and not be involved in different things uh, uh, abroad. So uh, for, for, for now, my, my only concern is, uh, is, is for, for uh, things that I have to do here, even if uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in uh, uh, what is uh, going on, on in, in Iran and uh, on different things. I, I, I look at the, uh, you know, at the different medias and I, I hear uh, different uh, uh, things and I, you know, I have a lot of uh, French and, and Iranian uh, friends uh, and my, my parents are, are, are Persian too. So, so I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in what is uh, happening in, in Iran, uh, but I, I'm not involved in uh, in uh, Iranian politics, it is so. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm really, I, I, I've very much enjoyed talking to you, and I, I hope you don't mind me saying, I'm very proud of you for for thank what, you very much. What you're thank doing. You. Uh, can I ask you before I let you? For, first of all, where are your parents? Are they in uh, in France? Yes, my parents are in France, and they live in the in the same city. Uh, in so the you're the, you're the mayor of your parents now. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is not a position Persian parents are used to being in. No. Nope. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so what do they have to say about this? Actually, they, they, they are very very proud and and they say uh, they say me uh, a lot of things to do and they are um, they, they are very yes they're very proud and happy and and and, uh, and that's all and they encourage me to to do. Uh, all I can, all I can do, and the best I can do, and they know that I, that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, motivated by the, the, you know, the job, and uh, they send me a lot of positive uh, things and messages, and and they encourage me. So I'm very happy to have them here. Did they vote for you? 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and even my sister. How do you know? <laughs> you mean? <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah. <laughs> well, well, actually, my, my sister uh, was not here, so I've voted for her <laughs> by, with uh, procreation. So I, I'm sure of that vote. For my parents, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Listen, uh, it's uh, your dream as a kid. Uh, was to be Jacques Chirac. Uh, would you like to be president of France one day? We will see you later. <laughs> We will see you later. Zatosh Bakhtiari, it's been a, a pleasure. Um, uh, merci que invarte gozashi vose vose ma. Thank you so much for the time. And I, we wish you all the best. We're cheering you on from across the pond. Merci. Thank you very, very much. Good office. Good office. Zatosh Bakhtiari. He's the new Iranian-French mayor of Nuit-sur-Marne, France. Zatosh, join me from Nuit-sur-Marne today. Energizing conversation. Zatosh Bakhtiari still doesn't know if his parents voted for him, and I, I, I don't either. I mean, let's face it. Uh, would, would our parents vote for us? Uh, Captain Reza, uh, the huge Captain Reza, <laughs> the <laughs> balloon-like, uh, Groovy Shia, and uh, the fabulous Keon. Uh, mics are back on. Um, how did you, what did you think, uh, fabulous Keon? Not to sound patronizing, but I'm really proud of him. The first Iranian mayor in France, and at age 30, perhaps the youngest. I, I was smiling throughout the interview. I could feel his energy it's i really enjoyed that that's oh. lovely <laughs> and groovy shaya yes I, I love that part that he said there is some problem but i'm young i, <laughs> <laughs> I love that I love yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. young he is for sure not only he is 30 only 30 years old but he looks 15. he does <laughs> he yeah. looks yeah. even younger yeah. than 30. Yeah, he's diminutive right? he's yeah. diminutive that's good that's going to serve him well All right when he's yeah. 60 and uh, yeah. and has a youthful look about him it, it's clear to me this guy you know you know it's 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 kind of like the the musician who starts at age five or, you know, uh, I always use this example because I'm Canadian and my reflexively I go to hockey, but Wayne Gretzky was on the ice at the age of two, you know, and then became the greatest hockey player ever. He's been doing this since he was a kid, you know, yeah. and so it's a sense of um, focus and destiny. And yeah. you just know that notwithstanding some God-given event, I don't know, something derailing his life somehow or something, uh, hopefully not, that he's on this trajectory to be, I mean, he could be the, he could be the president of France. I hope so. He'll be the first Iranian president <laughs> of France, crazy. which would be I'm very interesting. I'm rooting for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to, I mean, you know. A long way to go. At but that yes. point, we'll have to assess his politics. At yeah. this point, we just go, <laughs> yeah. we love he's you. Go ahead. You're the mayor of a town. Yeah. Uh, all right. The gang has convened. Uh, it is time to get to the letters. Here we go. All right. So this week on episode 54, we had a feature interview with composer, producer, and pianist Reza Rohani. Um, so on Instagram, we have Neda Rohani. Wait, Wait a, minute. a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even catch that. Is she related? She can't be. She didn't say it, but... She says, an exception. Great work, brother. <laughs> <She said. laughs> I wonder. I don't know. I, I should look into this, but it doesn't sound like she's related. So she says, an exceptional interview showing both the professional side as well as Reza's unique sense of humor. Nice. Beautiful. And then we have Patisa Gava on Instagram wrote, one of the best and most inspiring interviews of all time. Wow. wow. All right. Those are big words. Sorry, sorry, pa sorry. Parisa. Parisa, what was the last name? Gava. G-A-V-A. I, I think there's something wrong there, buddy. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I really don't know, but it's okay. weird to say Gava. Go not Gava. Go <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, what a, but poor Patty Saw. Okay. Thank you for that Thank very you. kind that comment. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Beautiful name as well. <laughs> and, uh, and I feel free to send us your actual pronunciation because honestly, this is based we on butchered, the I butchered yeah. it. Let's yeah, face right, it. All right. all right. So next up, we have Bita and no last name listed. Thank God, because I'd probably butcher <laughs> that as well. 
She says, well done, Gion and Rook team. Very interesting interview. Hearing the happy voice of Reza Rohani talking about harmony, not melody, reminded me of this quote from Albert Camus. He says, Camus. Camus. Oh, pardon me. Again, with the pronunciation. A famous <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't know that how most to people have heard of. <laughs> I've never heard of. It's okay. Yeah, it's all okay, right. Okay, he quotes. <laughs> but what it... <laughs> Albert Goffa <laughs> Camus <laughs> is <laughs> so powerful. Albert Camel. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, he says, yes, oh Camus my. said, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Did you know the pronunciation, Reza? <laughs> this one I did. Oh, I mean, my this, God. Trust me, I probably wouldn't, but this one I did. Okay, okay. Albert Camus, his yeah. quote is, but what is happiness except except the simple harmony between a man and the life he leads. Mm. Ah, beautiful. Again, this is a, thank you for that letter, uh, Bita. And and this is uh, interesting, again, in the context of the uh, the piece that uh, Negin uh, Dusti Alavi has written for uh, on our blog at uh, rookmedia.com about this interview and how she, because uh, Bita says, you know, hearing this uh, happy voice of Reza Rohani, how uh, Negin's take was, there's, there was some sadness there for Negin about this talented person having to leave Iran, having to leave his homeland in order to pursue the music that he wants to play. So that's at rookmedia.com. Just another promo for our Rook Reads. Sorry, Keon. No, no. Keep going. Hope. And then moving on, we have general letters from no specific episode in particular. On YouTube, we have username, no name listed, Raven Gacha. I can't screw that up. That's how it's spelled. Uh, he or she says, Hey, Gion, what an amazing production. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Raven. Or Raven. Raven, uh, perhaps. Raven. <laughs> and then we have Mehrdad Sadri wrote, You and your team, Gion, are wonderful. Every day better than the day before. Oh. Just keep it up. Very kind. Beautiful. Yeah. And then on Instagram, we have Sam Sodeif wrote, Glad to hear your new program here again. You and your genius talent was missing in the world for a while. Wow. Okay. These are, you don't usually read the nice ones. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Keon. This yeah, is what's, what's, what's going on today. You're reading middle. all the nice ones. I know. It's all right. a good Thank read. you. Yeah. Thank you. Those are all my letters of the day. Thank you. <laughs> I give you a letter of the day, all of you. All right. And then, uh, so last week on episode 53, we had a feature interview with Jane Lewison, director of the Gulha Project. She spoke about her multi-year mission to preserve Persian culture, music, poetry, and art from the 20th century. So a few people wrote into that specific episode. We have a Sepeh Samavi. He emailed us, and in the subject line, he put on Iranianness. He wrote, Dear Jian and Rook team, thank you for your hard work. I think it is especially important, even necessary, for the diaspora to actively try to understand what it means to be Iranian because we do not have the luxury of being immersed in Iranian society. This lack of immersion makes it difficult to gain an intuition. By inviting such a diversity of guests, especially guests immersed in Iranian society, listening to Rook is a great step towards an intuitive understanding. Mm. Best of luck on the show. I hope to hear more amazing interviews. Okay. Beautiful Thank letter. Thank you, Seper. Well, that's not letter of the day. I, I almost wanted to make it one because mm. it was quite profound. But uh, moving on, we have on Better be a friggin' good letter of the <laughs> I, day. Well, after, I, uh, oh, God. Uh, the dismissing pressure's Dismissing all of these excellent <laughs> letters. <laughs> uh, it's a tough job, okay? <laughs> Picking the letter of the know, day. It's not easy. <laughs> all right. Is, there, is any more words from Albert Camus on this? <laughs> <laughs> Albert Camel, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> all right. On YouTube. Uh, so last week, uh, during that same uh, episode, we had this discussion on funny translations of certain words from English to Persian. For example, sponge translates to scotch. Es Scotch, yeah, pardon yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and because, so, uh, which is the brand name. They, they, it yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have a username, Par, Papar Adab. That's, you know, that's how it is. I don't know if that's a name or a username. Anyway, I'm looking at Chai. Is like, is that a name? It's beautiful. Papar. Well, it is, yeah. <laughs> it's very nice. All right. Papar is so nice. he or she wrote, Gian, thank you so much for the program and a million thanks to Jane Lewison. As for the correct translation of sponge, the Farsi word is isfange, meaning something soft. The word scotch is related to a harsh cleaning object, which is used when isfange cannot remove the stain. Oh. Scotch Bright was the first brand of the harsh cleaning object introduced to the Iranian market. Wait a minute. So was uh, so Ponce on the artist and producer Susan were wrong when they said that sponge was a scotch? Uh, I think, I, think I believe this one actually. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, Spanish. Scotch is more hard than for 
tough mm. surfaces, but a sponge is like the yeah. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Little history lesson there. I enjoy that. <laughs> but is but producer Susan uh, out there? Yeah, she okay, is. Okay. Susan. We need an expert Producer in this. Producer Susan. No, no, she's, she's not. Oh no, we can't get our expert <laughs> opinion. <laughs> I'm yelling. All right, if we can't have that, I guess we have to go to the letter of the day. Oh. <laughs> All right, just to give some background on this, so uh, Shoja wrote to us, and he helped crack the case of the mystery behind the popular Canada Dry Orange Drink in Iran uh-huh. that we discussed during that same episode. All right, so, so I think it was you, Jian. You were talking about. I was how talking about being a five-year-old when we went to Iran. <laughs> yeah in the mid 70s and and I'm this little kid and they would take us to the the cabaret the uh, cabaret I guess at, at night and I couldn't order alcohol or whatever so they said would you like Pepsi or Canada Dry and get, so I knew Canada Dry as this orange fizzy orange drink that's and that's all I knew about Canada before we moved to Canada that there was going to be lots of fizzy orange drink only to my shock <laughs> and awe and surprise that Canada Dry uh, here in North America is more is like a ginger ale. It's like a clear looking. Yeah. Um, so actually, I should say we have received a I've received a schooling from a bunch of people <laughs> that not only was Canada Dry it was a thing I didn't imagine it yeah. in Iran, but it was uh, and and a few people have echoed what you guys said that there was uh, they gave you the option of see oh, you're not a G mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. do you want black or do you want orange that's those are, basically Coke or Pepsi or, or what they would call Canada Dry. But then we got this letter, so go ahead. Yeah, I didn't so know you were going to make a letter of the so day. So the yeah, code all right, uh, all right. like solve the mystery. So Shoja Edin Zianyan wrote to us on YouTube saying, first off, congrats to Jian and the Rook team for the launching and running of the Rook program I just discovered. I'm a bit older than all of you, just a little bit with a wink face. So I've got some added info in response to your question about Canada Dry in Iran. The drink Canada Dry didn't come only with the orange drink you were talking about. Uh It came in many colors and (laughs) tastes, perhaps as many as seven, if I am not (laughs) exaggerating. For sure, there were many. There was one with no color, like a Sprite, another one milky, if I correctly remember. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The one I liked the most as a kid was brownish and tasted like chocolate. Ew. (laughs) He says, well, after a while, the orange one in color and taste became overwhelmingly more popular, probably fitting best in the Iranian climate and culture and gradually kicked the others out. Ah, that's amazing. So the orange one in in Canada Dry Survivor. (laughs) Yeah, in Iran. An orange one in Iran. He made it. Uh, That's fascinating. A milky (laughs) version and a chocolate version. Chocolate version. version. Shoja, what was his name? This was Shoja Edin Zianyan. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Shoja Edin Zianian. Thank you, Shoja Reza. Uh, Shaya, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Shoja. Thank you, the fabulous Keon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Reza and Gibi Shaya. Well, imagine getting up early, getting outside in the sunshine and fresh air, and hopping on your high-powered motorbike. Wind in your hair, zooming along on the road, feeling like you're going faster than you've ever gone anywhere. Oxytocin, dopamine, endorphins, serotonin, add a bit of adrenaline, and it's like a happy cocktail for your brain, right? At least, I'm told. Well, my next guest today is the first Harley Davidson female head road captain in the world and a popular Instagram presence as one of the best known female riders in the world. She is also the first Iranian female biker who has ridden 805 kilometers in 12 hours nonstop and 1700 kilometers in 19 hours nonstop. Shima Mehri is an Iranian Danish professional biker, TV presenter, model, translator, and mathematics teacher. 
Shima was born in Tehran. She moved to Dubai at the age of 28, right after she got her motorcycle riding license and bought her first bike, which, by the way, was a Harley-Davidson Sportster 803. In 2012, she became the first woman in the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, who did the 805-kilometer 12 hours nonstop challenge. In 2014, she got the title of road captain and became the first woman in the GCC to receive that title. And by by May 2016, Shima became the first woman in the world to be a head road captain. Shima Mehri moved to Denmark in 2017, where today she is thinking about a 200-day ride around the world. But first, right now, Shima Mehri joins me from North Jutland, Denmark today. Hello. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Actually, those things that you just said, it's right now, I feel that right now I need to jump on my bike. <laughs> <laughs> just hearing about your accomplishments makes you want to get on your bike. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I see. Hosh <laughs> Bahalet, that's great. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. You are very interesting. I mean, Shima, let me start here. On, in your latest post on Instagram, this is from a couple of weeks ago or so, yeah. you post a pic of your excellent biker boots and you write, yes, I'm crazy. Normal is boring for me. That's, <laughs> that's yeah, exactly. it's, it's quite a statement. Tell, tell, tell me about it. Oh, actually, uh, somehow I'm... Uh People around me, they usually they said that. Oh, you are so weird. How you are? You you should have a very interesting life. And yes, that's true because I hate to, you know, sit aside just reading a book and just wait to uh, become old. I hate it. So uh, since the time that I remember, I, my life was always full of adventure and. Just going all around and do crazy things. And yeah, that's my life. <laughs> the only part about it that I don't like about that statement is the part about re reading a book. I like reading books, but I, 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 it's not just because I want to get old and die. I mean, I enjoy books, but, <laughs> but, um, but you clearly, okay, so you're happy to embrace this craziness. And this is, I'm guessing, the way you've been since you were a kid, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, I was a first child and, you know, my parents, even they couldn't control me because they knew that if they put me somewhere just for one minute, I'm going to do something crazy. <laughs> so, so right now, especially that I feel really pity for them because, you know, it's, it was so hard for them to control me and make me calm down and not doing crazy stuff. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's my life. Well, listen, I, I want to hear the whole story about how an Iranian girl from a Muslim family who grew up in Iran ends up in Denmark as one of the world's best-known female bikers. But let me let me ask you some questions uh, about riding first, because I was I was trying to think about what happens to bikers in a pandemic. On the one hand, it's scary times for everyone, including you guys, obviously in Europe with this uh, COVID nineteen. On the other you probably can't catch COVID driving a motorcycle at 100 kilometers an hour on an open road. So has the pandemic affected your riding? Honestly, nothing. Because, you know, we are out in the fresh air, so we can ride all around. And especially here in Denmark, because we didn't have a, that strict uh, lockdown. So it was so easy for me, but uh, being out with the guys going to the bar and sitting in uh, close uh, places. So, you know, that part, we just omit that part. So we can, we're still riding here. And I'm sure that the other uh, bikers as well, they are still uh, riding. And fortunately, COVID-19 couldn't uh, affect on us. It can't catch up with you. Yeah. yeah, on the road, it's too. It you're, too it. you're too fast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what is the what is the schedule of a Harley Davidson rider? I mean, how often are you out there? Uh, actually, uh, officially, we have two uh, rides per week, uh, and one of them is early in the morning. Uh, most of the uh, groups all around the world they have so so they have such a rides which one of them is early morning and weekends, and the other one is in the evening time, actually. 
And but you know, most I guess that most of the bikers like me, they are going all around with their bikes. And yeah, so I can I can say that uh, we don't have that limit to say that. Oh, ri- right now it's not riding time for us. Every single moment is a riding time. I can see why you've become head captain. I can hear the, <laughs> the, the passion in your voice. So, so for someone who is new to this, you mm-hmm. know, there are people listening to us right now all around the world. Many of them are Iranians and many of them, some of them might be like my mother going, oh, in Chikar Dara Mikura, Chiara in Karara Mikura, worried about you. How would you sell this to someone who's, I mean, someone who's never even been on a motorcycle before? What is the sensation for you? I really encourage them. I encourage everyone, you know, if you want to uh, enjoy your life, if you want to uh, feel really free, uh, that you are free, that nothing can stop you, if you are looking for a a true happiness, if you are looking to feel the nature, just start riding your motorcycle. Uh, when you say that, okay, the Chikar Mikone, it's something that I always I hear about it. Yeah. Every single, you know, anytime that uh, I meet a new person, they will say the first thing. They don't say that, wow, you are a biker. They will say, oh, don't you be afraid <laughs> of accident and this stuff. They say, Come on, stop it. At the end, all of us, we are going to die. But the most important thing is that we enjoy our lives. You know, and, you know, some uh, some people, they like to go to the beach. Some people, they like to go to the forest, to the mountain, to, you know, to be a part of nature. But uh, I really I guarantee that for you that if you ride a motorcycle, on motorcycle, you can feel the wind. You can smell everything. You can smell the sand. You can be a part of the earth and you know and go uh, and the opposition of all the forces and that's the most amazing things in the world so this is uh, you sold me i feel like i want to end this interview and go out and get a motorcycle right now <laughs> well, why are we talking <laughs> enough talking i'm gonna stop reading books and getting old i gotta get a motorcycle uh, this is not your your day job right uh, this is what you're known for but what do you do when you're not biking teaching mathematics ah you are a mathematics <laughs> teacher no actually you know when i'm looking for the adventure even if and you know let me tell you the story like this when i was a small kid if anyone would ask me that okay uh, what what does your father do i would say that okay i don't know i don't know if he's a engineer if he's a carpenter if he's i don't know because you know he he was doing a lot of things all together and you know i raised like that so uh i i teach mathematics and especially in the pandemic i started to teach free to all the children who can speak in english all around the world and also i have my own company which is career service and cargo and also trade See? That's great. Even yes. When you ask me that, okay, what do you do in your free time? What do you do as a job? Even though that's right. not just a right. single right. thing. Well, yeah. I, I knew it would be an interesting answer, and I got one. Listen, I have a friend who is a who's a biker, and um, mm-hmm. he has told me at length, he's actually a childhood friend of mine, and he later in life discovered motorcycles, and, and he he has told me at length about the the sisterhood, the brotherhood that exists amongst bikers. That you, he talks about the fact that you can arrive in a brand new town, like uh, that you've never been to, and immediately find a friend if you see them on a Harley or you know. Has that been part of the appeal for you? This sense of community. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, right now I'm going to cry. Let me tell you something. Uh, I heard about it a lot before that I started to ride my motorcycle, okay? Uh, I, when I entered to my group and I started to ride in my motorcycle, uh, I had a lot of friends before, but 
you know, as soon as they found out that I'm riding motorcycle, they all disappeared. Mm. Okay. And, but instead, I found a lot of friends who are truly, truly like my brothers and sisters. You know, at the time, especially, you know, the time that I was in hospital after my accident, uh, I was so sad because my motorcycle was totally gone. And I was in hospital, I was thinking to get a new bike. And, you know, uh, I, I could afford it. But when we say that that's a sisterhood and brotherhood is that, you know, they started to gather money to help me oh. and to encourage me to get a new bike, you know. And, you know, it's not just for me, even though for my other friends. And, you know, right now that if I call my, uh, my biker friends who are in Dubai and just I ask them something, you know, 100% that I'm sure that they support me. Wow. I'm sure that even though if maybe I ask my own brother to do such a things for me, he wouldn't do that. That uh, that is that is beautiful. By the, by the way, the the accident you're referring to is the one you had in 2016, and you yeah. were in Dubai, and we'll get to that. But this okay. um, that sense of community is hard to find. I mean that that is it's it is amazing that you have that. Bikers are also Shima, as you know, of course, historically linked with counterculture. Uh, at the very least, there's this image of the the Harley Davidson rider who's a rebel who forsakes the urban environment for the open road and a self, sense of ultimate freedom. It, is the notion of being a rebel an unfair stereotype, or would you say that this is the way most Harley Davidson riders you know are, and and I suppose that you are in fact a rebel. Mm. it's so hard to answer that actually uh it depends that uh from which point of view you know i thought as a stereotype i felt that that some people they are looking at me in a different uh, point of view they especially as a female some part of society they cannot accept it Okay, but I found out that if I just uh, don't listen to them, if I just go for what that I believe in, then everything would disappear. Uh. Just me, my bike and road. And that's it. If you don't mind, I, I wanted to add one thing to our to your previous question that you asked. Sure. That uh, within the bikers, especially the Harley Davidson bikers, we have a quote that we says that uh, that's not blood that make us family. That's loyalty. Hmm. You know, I g and this loyalty is something that you cannot find it somewhere else. Even though I cannot explain it. They are with you everywhere. They support you. It doesn't matter that what. Just especially if they, you know, uh, if especially if they, if they found find out that you are in trouble, they are there for you. It, it, uh, by, and by the way, can uh, can anyone join the club? I mean, if you get a, a Harley Davidson, is there a test, or, <laughs> or, is, or is anyone, allowed, you know, okay. uh, do you have to be cool? I don't know. Do you like? Do they say, sorry, no, you're you not cool enough. I, I mean, okay. I, don't, I don't know if you guys will let me in if I get a motorbike. They would be like, yeah, no, nah, you're sure. not cool <laughs> enough. You're not tough enough. I don't know. It's good. No, I, you know what? Um, we have uh, all around the world all. I'm talking about the Harley Davidson bikers. Uh, we have a general club all around the world that they call it Hawk uh, and Harley owner group. And that's the group that very easily, as soon as you get a motorcycle, you can uh, join. But when we, uh, we talk about the MCs, MCs has more uh, rules to absorb people. So 
that's why that it depends that if you want to join a hawk so that's so easily and you are most welcome but if you want to join MCs, then you need to someone need to recommend you to that MCs because you know that's like a very close group so it depends I got you. I got you. Yeah. I'll be. I'd be happy to let be let into the hogs. Um, <laughs> it, it, I'm going to ask you a question that I think I know the answer to, but I just want to hear you spell it out. I, I'm guessing that riding is more about the journey than the destination. It's not about necessarily getting somewhere. It's about the journey that you're taking. I wonder if what what is happening in your mind when you're on that journey? Is it meditative almost somehow? Which would seem like a, a strange thing to say to somebody who's going 100 kilometers an hour and, and, and with a loud noise and, and zooming down the street, but, but the way you talk about it almost sounds like it's a form of meditation. If you take a look at that uh, your bike is a part of your body, okay? It's like that uh, you and your bike becomes united okay and then with this situation even though then when you are riding you don't even think about your riding that okay right now i should accelerate right now i should break your body your mind is doing it automatically even though when you want to turn okay just you need to think about it and you know, at the, when you start riding your motorcycle, and maybe your instructor tell you that, okay, just uh, think about it, and your bike will follow you. M most of the people they laugh and they say, that, "Oh, that's impossible." But mm. honestly, it's possible because your body and your bike at the same time being united, and you are it's just you yeah. the wind the speed the road and your body you know what i love about this it's almost like an instrument like um uh, a few months ago we had a, a classical pianist she's a great uh, uh pianist an iranian canadian uh, pianist named sana sotude and she spoke mm -hmm. about the piano almost being part of her her she feels like her her fingers on the keys and when she's in the zone it's almost she's one with the piano uh, i love this description it's it's uh, that you're one with the motorcycle while you're doing this it's part of you yeah exactly let's let's hear the story Shimajan, of, of how this all happened for you you were you're, you're growing up in iran in what sounds like a a moderately conservative muslim family in the 1980s as a kid what what first got you into the idea of wanting to ride motorcycles um i i uh i guess that i was around age 10 that i traveled with my dad to austria and it was the first time that I saw a huge gru a group of uh, female bikers that, you know, it, it, when I'm explaining to anyone, it, it's exactly like the slow motion for me. So I want <laughs> you to imagine that, Okay. you know, I, I was a standing uh, a side of the street and I heard a loud noise and then they came they passed through my eyes and then they stopped all of them they had helmets so when they removed their helmets it's exactly like the slow motion for me that <laughs> all their hairs fell down they were goddesses and, you know, goddesses I, for you I, I felt that i'm really in the movie you know and i said that dad i want to become a biker <laughs> and my dad was said that okay when you grow up, then we can make a decision about it. I said, no, I want to be a biker. I said, okay, we will talk about it. And, you know, the time passed. And this idea that one day I should ride a motorcycle was with me. And, by the way, I need to talk about my mom because uh, I have two little brother And... Uh, always he, you know you know iranian mom how they are and sure. he he used to tell him to my brothers that look shiramo halaletun nemikonam agar ruzi bebinam sabar motor beshid ya inke sigar bekeshid 
Right. So, uh, so <laughs> I, uh, I draw the line at motorcycles and cigarettes. That's not a, you're not allowed. Yeah. Exactly. And now my brothers, they followed her, <laughs> but definitely I couldn't. And, you know, the time that I moved to Dubai, I knew that if I told my mom that, mom, I'm going to get my license, she would definitely be angry. Uh-huh. And so I waited. So I waited. I got my motorcycle and exactly the same day I got my uh, my license and then exactly the same day I got my motorcycle. So in, I called in my Dubai, mom. in Dubai, right? Yeah, in yeah, Dubai. Yeah, yeah. And I called my mom and I said that, "Mom, I got my license." I said, "What license?" I said that my motorcycle license. I said, "Okay, wait. That's enough." Okay. You you did it. Okay, that's perfect. Congratulations. That's enough. Now stop. <laughs> yeah, stop. And don't continue. So that mom, I have another news. So what? Said so, mom, I got my motorcycle. So what? What did you do? Please don't do that. So that mom, it's done. So it's done. I already I got it. She didn't say anything. Uh, after my first record, I when I had a lot of interview and I sent her and she sent me a picture from her the time that she was uh, around 18 and she was on a motorcycle. What? That's amazing. And you know, I said to that mom, please, why you didn't tell me? And she said that, you know, I knew that it's so dangerous and I really, I loved to become a biker but oh, it wow. was my dream i couldn't follow it but any the time that you called me and you said that you got your motorcycle inside me i really i i was proud of you wow and so that seriously you killed me all this time <laughs> and i couldn't just enjoy as much as i want because in in just a a part of my brain, I was thinking that, oh, you didn't like it? He said, no, I'm really proud of you. And, oh, yeah. That must have been a beautiful moment for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what about your dad? I mean, look, there's a couple of ways in which you've departed from, I, I, I suppose, what your parents would have expected of you growing up. One is the motorcycle riding. The other is becoming a Christian. And I want to ask you about that in a bit. But but what what did you, what was your father's reaction when he first, I mean, it was all fun and games when you're in Austria and you say, dad, I want to do that. And he goes, okay, Azizan, don't worry. Yeah, one day, you know, let's go back, you know. Uh, but <laughs> what, what about when he first realized you were serious about becoming a, a biker? You know, my... Um my dad w- could accept it because you know, uh, you know, dads usually they think much more logic than mothers. So he knew that right now, even every day that I'm talking with him, he says that okay, digechi car kardi. What did you do? What's new? That dad, nothing, and he he knows that deeply inside that okay, Shima can't just sit aside and not (laughs) doing nothing you know so it was so clear for him even though i guess at the time that i told him that i want to become a biker he knew that one day i'm doing and when you broke the records and became the head captain all that he's probably uh proud of you as well right and not not for my third record that i wanted to but the rest yes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Let's get to that. Listen, you, you've you done an, an admirable job of messing with gender stereotypes too, especially as an Iranian. You, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I was wondering, I was thinking about you and thinking, I wonder if that was part of the attraction for you, like that that motorcycling has traditionally obviously been viewed as a as a male endeavor uh, and particularly coming from a patriarchal society like Iran. When you started to ride, was it, because partly as a woman, you felt a sense of freedom and empowerment? Uh, I've never think that uh, there is any difference between women and men, okay? Never, ever, mm. okay? And I always I said that to everyone who asked me that, look, I'm so happy that I'm a woman and I'm really proud of this, that as a woman, 
I could do some things impossible. Not impossible for me, but impossible in point of view of society. Yes. And that's the point that it can encourage the other woman as well. You know, and also men as well. Because, you know, for example, maybe there is a guy who would love to dance, okay? But what do the other people, they say? Right, we right. have this, unfortunately, this is the culture of East that Mardom okay. yes. yeah. Mardom? What are people going to think? Yeah. Expectations, stereotypes, uh, generalizations. But the, part of the magic of this to me is, uh, and I don't even know if this is something that you can answer, but you're, you were a girl growing up in a country um, where an Islamic regime is in power, where even riding bicycles is basically okay. illegal for women. I know I know there's women who do ride bicycles there, but it can be problematic. It's not the cultural norm, certainly, for women to become bikers. <laughs> there weren't examples around you down the street of all kinds of people doing that. So for you to be able to even dream that this is what you were going to do, that you're going to become a professional biker, is quite extraordinary. Tell me how you were able to do that. Look, you are saying dream. Okay, when you know when you when you have a dream, okay, it, it would remain as a dream until that you step forward through that. Okay, otherwise, it's it's impossible that that dream becomes true. Not just riding a motorcycle, not a, anything. Okay, so, and you know, especially you, you talked about Iran. Okay, let me tell you, there is a girl, there is a biker, uh, I don't know if you know her or no, uh, Shahzad Naraki. Okay, she is a biker in Iran, and she is, I'm really proud of her because she is in Iran and she is trying to encourage the other women also to step forward to get this right to have a, a motorcycle license and training and you know this is so beautiful and let me and there is one other thing that i really need to emphasize on that you know the most amazing things about all these stories not mine even though the other women who did some impossible things even though with that regime is that because they were in a limited position because the other thing they thought that okay they cannot do anything we can control women this i guess that this empowered them it gave them that a lot of power to stand up to you know even though right now there are a lot of girls in iran in tehran that they are riding motorcycle you know it's amazing that's beautiful and you know i'm also a part of the, i was a part of that society and nothing could have stopped me and even right now well that it is empowering when you when you talk about uh, um, women doing that in Iran, uh, particularly given the the current government, the current regime in in power, and and some of the expectations, why, why did you decide to move to Dubai? Why not stay in Iran and try and ride a motor motorcycle then? Actually, going to Dubai was a part of my adventure, actually. Because I, I just wanted to uh, move forward and, uh, you know, I had some problems in Iran. And so that's the reason that because, you know, I was Christian that you mentioned, even though some, uh, some of that part was some of revealing. And I was like, you know, like the other Iranians, we were looking for freedom. Yes. We were looking for a better life. So... Shima, what, what, tell me about the conversion to Christianity. How, how, how young were you when you felt like that's something that was important for you to do? Are you promise me, are you promise me not to laugh at me? I, I would never <laughs> laugh at you. I mean, uh, <laughs> I laugh at some of your Instagram posts, but, uh, but not, about, well, not with this question. Okay. Go ahead. You know, uh, I was three at age three that I met Jesus and 
uh, let me tell you uh, that uh, I told you at the beginning of our interview that my parents, they couldn't control me. Yes. So uh, one of my uh, friends, uh, one of my father's friend family, actually, they, uh, they were Christian and they started to take care of me the time that my parents, they are at work. So I was with them. And I always, I said that the things that uh, connect me to Jesus is my birthday. Okay, I, I born on 1st of January. Yes. So you could imagine that in Christmas before my birthday, there were Christmas tree and everything was, they should be prepared and all, you know, all these uh, jingly tingy. And you so thought that I, was for you. Yeah, exactly. I thought that, oh, that's for my birthday. My birthday is coming. So, uh, by the way, his, his birthday is December 25th, not January yeah. 1st, right? Yeah, no, yeah. but you know, I knew that all these <laughs> right. things are coming for my birthday. Right. I see. You know, okay. it, it's a preparation for my birthday. I, I thought so, you know. So, because, you know, yeah. Jesus had his birthday in preparation yeah. for your birthday. <laughs> exactly. Yes, okay. It's like that. You know, uh, in very old days when they, uh, it was just a birthday, you know, all these uh, colorful papers all around the house and yes. everyone started to prepare everything from a week before. So that was the idea. So, so yeah, I asked that. Oh, that's my birthday. I said, no, that's Jesus' birthday. I said, oh, I love Jesus because his birthday is almost uh, like my birthday. So I love him. So it just started like this. I've never feel that, okay, I'm Muslim or I'm coming from a Muslim family. So I should be a Muslim. So since the first the first time that I understood a difference between Islam and Christianity was exactly that time. So I've never had this chance to uh, understand uh, Islam. So I see, yeah. But why? I mean, just just parenthetically, as, as uh, out of interest, because I've, I've I understand the sentiment of not totally understanding, you know, an organized religion, uh, something like Islam being foisted upon you by your family or your parents, etc. Um, why not just not be religious? Why why the choice to to actually choose another religion? That's also one option. Yeah, <laughs> that's one option. You know, the most important thing is humanity. You know that. Uh, has a um, morality ethic, you know, that's the most important. Yes. That you, uh, you fight for the right things. It doesn't matter that if you are Muslim, Christian, uh, Jewish, or anything, even the atheist, okay? But know that, okay, the things, what are the consequences, the things that I'm doing? Is it good? Is it right? Is it wrong? And I guess that that's the most important thing. So we we talked about your parents coming to terms with you being a biker. Um, mm -hmm. Have they made peace with the idea that you're uh, uh, that you're a devotee of Christ, that you're a Christian? Yeah, yeah, especially because you know, uh, most you know Muslims in Iran, most of them they don't participate in. Islamic uh, practicing, right, you know, right. so it's just only a name. So right. my father always says that, that it's so important that for me that I just, I know that you are doing the right things and don't uh, hurt anyone else and you fight for it. You just know that what is right and wrong. It doesn't matter that in which religion, even though without religion, but just be a good human, and that's it. So, Shima, let, let's talk about you going to Dubai. You become this. Um, you start breaking records as a as the first female um, Harley Davidson biker to do all kinds of things in, in terms of the the length of races and the endurance. 
Um, and, but there are some cautionary tales here. Back to my mother saying, oh, this is where it gets difficult. This is where the, the folks get worried for their daughters or sons getting on the bikes, I guess. In April 2016, and you alluded to this earlier in the interview, uh, you were on one of this, this, this nonstop 2,500 kilometer ride, and you had to stop after 1,000 kilometers. So what happened there? It was his Zabedar, Nasi his Zabedar, get off the time. But, you know, um, I, it was almost uh, tr- for that ride, I planned for almost three months. And unfortunately, that day, uh, I knew that a sandstorm is coming. The weather is not good, but I just wanted to do it. You know, and I said, that, okay, I'm going to for this ride. I'm going to do it. And okay, maybe if I feel that I'm not okay, I would have stopped. And I started with the rain. I started to going all around, around almost 1,000 kilometers. And the weather suddenly it becomes perfect. It was really good for just a 15 minutes. Sorry, by the way, and, when you're on a ride like that, are you by yourself or are you, are you in uh, a group? No, actually, uh, it was me and my husband. My husband was uh, bringing all the equipment in the car. Okay. And we were on, uh, on the radio and uh, together and we were talking to each other and it was totally dark and, you know, the weather became really good. And then... I was exactly on a roundabout and my husband said that, okay, if you go through the right side and then uh, you would reach faster to the, uh, to the next petrol station. I said, okay, because I, I wasn't following the, the map. So I went through that one and suddenly I, and my speed was, I guess around uh, 170 or 180 kilometers per hour. And suddenly I heard kiss, 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 kiss. And I opened my eyes. I opened my eyes. I was on the ground and my husband was crying. Sorry for this sad thing, see. My husband was crying and I said that, okay, I'm here, I'm here, I'm fine. And he couldn't hear me. I said, okay, so that's done. I am dead. But, you know, even though at that time I was so happy that, okay, I, I was, you know, I died exactly during the ride. So it was perfect. And <laughs> You have a great <laughs> attitude. <laughs> yeah, a- <laughs> I said, okay, so okay, yeah. I, I, I did happily. So again, I call him, I call him, I mean, I'm fine. Come and help me to take out my helmet. And he, he, he couldn't hear me, so I removed my own helmet Then suddenly, because it was totally dark, it was 3 a.m. And he came to me and, you know, he said that, oh, all oh, your face, oh, you are alive, your face, blood, and, you know, he passed out. I was okay, but he passed he out. He passed out. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. And then I ended up in the hospital. <laughs> so how, oh, so, so what happened to you? How badly injured were you? Okay, uh, I had two uh, of my, I had fraction on my spine, two, uh, two of my spine, they had a, a fraction that, so uh, they put, right now I'm an iron woman, so they put uh, two platinum on my spine cord and yeah. If so I, I was, so, and by the way, is Amir okay or do you? Yeah, he's okay. Because okay. he passed he, uh, out too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was okay. But I tried to comfort him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had to take care of him while your yeah. spine was broke. So no, I, he's so I, sensitive. So that's why I was trying to do the math here. I was looking at your accomplishments. Mm-hmm. You and I knew you got into this accident in in April 2016, mm-hmm. and then you become the first woman head road captain in the world in May 2016. Is that to suggest that you got back on the bike within a month? Exactly. This is the, this is the, this is the, this is where we started with the Instagram quote about you being crazy. This is the crazy part now, right? This is crazy, Shima. That's the things that right now I'm gonna to tell you. Uh, It's a bit, you know, 
it's the most interesting part about this. Okay. I really I love it. Yeah, uh, I, the time I, I was in hospital for two weeks and every single moment I was thinking about my new bike and, you know, all my friends, biker friends, they were with me all these moments, even though at night they were with me, <laughs> they were sleeping in my bed, uh, in my room. And, you know, we were talking about and discussing about the exhaust, about the bike, which color it should be and how should we customize it. So all this time it passed like this. Uh, after the surgery, exactly a day after, I asked the doctor, okay, when are you going to release me? Said so that, okay, just to sleep. As soon as you could walk, I will release you. I said that, okay promise me said okay i promise you and you know uh after i guess after three or four days they started to open all my bondage and they said that okay now step by step every day you go one one step just we want to make sure that you don't feel dizzy and these stuff the first day that they let me to walk i guess that i walk around 500 steps I just, I, I was in a pain, you know, and I said that Shima, go ahead, Shima, walk, Shima, walk, just pretend that you can walk. So then the doctor would release you from the hospital. Hmm. And, you know, the doc my doctor was in shock. That, okay, what's she doing? And then uh, I told him, look, I walk. So now it's the time for, uh, for you to release me from the hospital. And still, I have my picture. Exactly, the, he released me. Uh, it's uh, it was eleven in the morning, you know, and all my friends they were with me, and they they came to take me home. But they said, that, "Okay, could you please stop by Harley Davidson shop? I need I need the smell <laughs> of at uh, the shop. I need to smell the bike." And after two weeks, I got my motorcycle. And I guess it was after a month, I started riding again. And I had an appointment with my doctor. I went in and my doctor said, okay, how are you doing? Did you start your physio? I said, yes, doctor. I started, <laughs> uh, I started to ride. He said, oh, it's really good. It's amazing that you started to ride. Are you riding bicycle? I said that. Doc, seriously, I'm riding Harley. <laughs> said that. Are you sure? Said, yeah. Look, look at my picture. This is my new bike. It's that. What are you doing? I've never seen such a crazy patient. I've never had this, <laughs> seen such a things in ho my whole life. And yeah. And I started to ride again. By the way, this is a terrible story. I hope young <laughs> people listening. Do not take away from this that uh, we're going to be people are going to be writing complaining that their 10 year old got into an accident. They want to get on a motorcycle now within two weeks. Um, wow. So this is but you don't just get back on the motorbike. You then become you go on you go on another marathon race and become the first woman head road captain in the world of Harley yeah. Davidson. C c explain to us very briefly. What does it mean to be head road captain? Okay, you know, when you're riding with the groups, let's say that I'm talking, for example, in uh, Harley owner groups, which is general all around the world, uh, we have uh, different types of positions, okay? We have a road marshals that they are, when a large group, they are riding all together, they would take care, they would close all the exits on the highways and they would make sure that all the tribe is going well okay and then we have a road captain who is uh, leading the tribe and we have the head road captain that road captain and all the road marshals are working almost under his orders and he is the one or she is, let's say, why, why am I saying he? And she is the one, he is the one mm -hmm. that uh, make a decision that which route they need to go and when, uh, how everything should, in which position they should ride and 
where should we block on the on the highways or on the roads and actually all the safety is in the hands of head road captain yeah so that i mean that's an important position it's yeah, not just exactly. a distinction it's an important yeah. position um you know when you become this head road captain and i guess the news travels around the world and a lot of iranians in the diaspora and back in iran are proud of you you don't escape the uh, ever watchful eye of the iranian regime from what i understand because you um you ended up leaving dubai after nine years in 2017 you moved okay. to denmark where of course we're speaking to you today uh and there's a difficult story there tell tell, tell us what happened with um people coming after you in dubai uh, most of that it became because I was working with Farsi One, I was TV presenter over there, and you know, at the time, uh, exactly in uh, November and December 2016, everything gets hard for all the uh TV stations, especially in Dubai, and as you know, in Turkey as well. And so uh, they came all around for everyone. So uh, they shut down the Farsi one. And also, as I remember, they shut down uh, gems as well. And so most of the group, they needed to leave Dubai because, you know, it's not, it, it wasn't safe over there. And as you know, uh, Emirates and also Iran, they, somehow they show that they are not closed but iranian government very easily they could go uh you know go through the people and catch everyone that they wanted so it was the reason that i left dubai and i moved well, why why were they targeting you did it have something to do with the fact that you're you're getting some celebrity from being a, 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 a motorbike uh, um, leader or or was it just because you were a presenter no, on TV? No, I, I can't say that. Maybe it's one of the reasons, but not the main reason. I guess the, the main reason was my uh, that I was a TV presenter, I was a Christian, you know, everything. I have everything in my resume. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He got TV a lot of problems. Yeah, Christian yeah. Right, and, right. you know, a biker. And <laughs> right, 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 right. So they, so, so, but this is quite scary. They actually... Um, a car comes after you and hits you while you're on your motorbike. Is this true? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was exactly on uh, on December, on, on Christmas, on Christmas 2016. It happened to me. Uh, I was with a, I was in uh, with a tribe. We were coming back from the charity on Christmas, and we were standing at the traffic light and then suddenly a car hit me from the right side and then i fell down and then they ran away and you know it wasn't the, you know it wasn't an accident yeah bec yeah because the, you know they uh they told me from before that they are gonna to do it they are gonna to kill me because you know they treated me a lot I received a lot of uh, letters from them and, you know, they called me. From whom? The you IH, know, at the beginning IH. they said that they are from the embassy of Iran. And, yeah. Oh, that's sad. And why did you choose Denmark? <sighs> it's sad news. I didn't want to come to Denmark. I had my own visa for U.S. and we uh, we said that okay, that's the easiest part that we can go because I was in U.S. before, so I said okay, we are going to U.S. and I had my own visa. But Mr. Lovely Trump came exactly right. <laughs> wow! In yeah. January two thousand seventeen, so I said okay, that's not the place that because immediately he said that. Uh, we don't let Iranian to come here in the right. U.S. So then I needed to come to Denmark. My brother was here. And so, and that's the place that I could get easily my visa and come here. Well, Denmark's a great place. Although if Trump found out you were a uh, Christian biker, he might he might <laughs> let you in. You <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
Maybe. I, I didn't have this chance to negotiate with <laughs> you him. Didn't, but. <laughs> you, didn't, you couldn't call him. Um, well, I, I'm so sorry that happened to you in Dubai. And, and uh, you haven't had any threats since you've been to Denmark then in the yeah. last three years. So for years, the majority of just getting back to you, what you represent, both symbolically and literally as this, um, as one of the best known female bikers in the world, for, for years, the majority of literature on women who participate in the world of motorcycling has, has tended, I'm sure, as you know, Shima, to present this image of either subservience or kind of um, a, a dismissive demeaning kind of image so there's expressions like biker chick or bitch seat mm -hmm. um, I, I know that now the number of women bikers in the in the world has grown significantly does that language still exist is it still prevalent or are things changing within the bikers no we don't have such a things but you know most of these uh most of these things are coming from the outside of uh, our community, okay? The same way that they take a look at, if you say that, okay, I'm a biker, the first thing that society would think about, yeah, oh, it's when you say that, you are saying to the people that I'm a biker, I'm Harley Davidson biker, they say, oh, are you a gangster? Are you a drug dealer? Do you have a gun? You know, that's the mentality that they have. Also, they have exactly the same mentality that, okay, any girls who are riding a motorcycle, they, they wear bikini and they sit on Harley Davidson, you know? But, you know, as a biker, we don't have such a things in a biker community. The same way that we talked about it, the sisterhood and brotherhood, yes. even though they don't let anyone to just look at you in a wrong way. And, you know, it's really clear that definitely you cannot ride a motorcycle with bikini because the engine is so hot. And, you know, and I feel that right a little bit this uh, mentality is going to change. Shima, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. I, I, I really appreciate your... Um, your spirit, uh, your uh, life outlook, uh, and the story that you've shared with us. You've, you've been a, a huge influence on thousands of riders. I, I can only imagine, especially women, when you receive messages from Iranian girls who are new riders or want to become a rider, whether they're in Iran or outside of Iran in the diaspora or uh, Middle Eastern girls who, who reach out to you on Instagram, what what do you think is the best piece of advice you can give to them? Just go get your bike and start riding. It doesn't matter that how old are you. It doesn't matter that from what co what kind of culture you are coming, what religion you have. It doesn't matter. Just try to be yourself and enjoy your life. That's the most important thing. Because, you know, especially Iranian women, Eastern women, they say that, okay, right now I'm old. No, for riding a motorcycle, it's not, it's never late. Just start to do it. Then as soon as you start to ride, then you will truly understand what do I mean. The, the sounds of the engine, the, the wind, you know, the road, everything. There is nothing much more amazing than the sunrise down the road while you are riding through it. I know you haven't been back to Iran in 15 years, but I, I'll i bet that you would love to ride there one day if it becomes Inchalus. possible. What's that? In Chalus. Oh, wow. Yeah. On the way to Shomal. Yeah. Haraz ro uh, Roadway. I hope so. One day. Shima Mehri, thank you so much for this today. I hope to see you before too long. Uh, I know I won't be able to catch up with you on, uh, unless I'm on a motorcycle, so I'm going to practice. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to come to Denmark and you, you can be the head captain and I'll, I'll try and keep up. Uh, thank Perfect. you for this. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you so much. Khodafis. Shima Mehri, she's an Iranian Danish professional biker, TV presenter, model, translator, mathematics teacher. In 2016, she became the first Harley Davidson female head road captain in the world. And Shima Mehri joined us from North Jutland, Denmark today. 
And this is full time for Rook for today. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, for all things Rook, you can head to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com. Links to all of our social media platforms are there and all of our episodes. Thanks to the amazing team that puts this show together and works so hard on this. Producer Susan Ponta, the artist, the fabulous Keon, Aramir Dodd, English Muhammad, Savvy Roham, Groovy Shia, and Captain Reza. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Remember to be Rook. And of course... As ever, Mizunbashim.